We can start. Uh, and of course, our next keynote speaker is uh, Jayati Ghosh, um, uh, who I think most of you probably know. Again, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but it's every time extremely <laughs> genuine, incredibly honored uh, to have her here and accept to give, give the keynote and, and, uh, and also to deepen our friendship as well and our intellectual connections and so on. And uh, of course, I think probably everyone here knows her so I probably don't need to say too much more, but if you don't know her, you should know her. <laughs> and start reading everything she writes on a daily basis, and then you'll be much wiser, uh, although perhaps not more optimistic. But uh, <laughs> no, no, I, in terms of, you know, you know the, the elephants in the room and so on. So with, no, before I put my foot deeper in a hole, I'll just pass it on to Jayati. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. It's been a great pleasure to be here, and it's, uh, it's been a very fascinating and a very illuminating symposium, so uh, I'm really happy to be part of it. And I'm not going to do a PowerPoint, so uh, sorry about that, or, or you're welcome, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, and I'm not really going to talk about the main themes, either global redistribution, well, a little bit social policy and development, yes. But what I really want to talk about is, is something that hasn't been talked about, well, two things that haven't been talked about too much in the last two days. Uh, monetary policy or policies about money, one of the macroeconomic policies, and how they impact on social protection, but specifically in the case of India, which is another country that hasn't been mentioned too much in the last few days. And there are a couple of themes that I just want to just, you know, mention in the beginning, which I think uh, relate to the rest of this symposium, so it's not as far out as uh, you might think. One is that, you know, it's very clear now that there have been all these differing attitudes to what constitutes both social protection and social policy, and every country really has its own interpretation, it's context specific, it's political economy regime specific, it's, it's all kinds of things. And of course, there is this huge discussion about you know, whether you provide uh, universal, unconditional uh, services and cash or whatever, but with good quality public services, or you go for limited and targeted uh, conditional cash transfers and all of that kind of thing. Now, in the Indian case, of course, the discussion has been very much in terms of we will substitute public provision with cash transfer, which I think is an absolute mistake and a terrible uh, decision, but that, that has been pretty much the Indian discussion. But this Indian discussion is couched in something which is, I think, part of a broader Okay, um, yeah. fine-tuning, yes? Fine-tuned like yeah. Mr. Trump's administration, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, uh, which is really, if you like, the demise of the rights-based discourse. You know, in India it was very, very big. A, a decade ago it, it dominated public policy discussion. Everything was framed in terms of human rights. The employment guarantee was a right to work. The food uh, law was a right to food. There was a right to education law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in fact, bureaucrats in India, but I imagine pretty much everywhere in the world, they roll their eyes when you mention human rights. It's just not a thing anymore. And of course, most of the political leadership is quite openly against the rights-based discourse. Nonetheless, I think there's a kind of irreversibility of some of these moves. Uh, we can come back to this, but the employment guarantee, however much it is disliked and despised by the current regime, has proved to be so politically important that it cannot really be dislodged uh, despite their best efforts. But nonetheless, I think this demise of rights-based has a particular significance which is global, it's not just in India. And the third thing that I want to take up, which has really been very important in what I'm going to talk about, uh, but I find it's quite evident now in many parts of the world, whether it is Latin America or is, if you like, um, is anti-corruption as the new mantra of the right-wing groups. It's very evident in Latin America, but it's pretty, I mean, it, it was very much, you know, we in India, we are pre-Trump, okay? We've been there, we've done that. We've had it all for three years now. So we can tell you a lot about it. But you know, he also wanted to, to clean the place up from this corrupt regime of the past. 
Mr. Trump wants to drain the swamp, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, so there is this whole um, discourse of anti-corruption, which is not really about it, but uh, about uh, being anti-corruption. But it subsumes a bunch of other things, all of which serve to dramatically undermine social protection. So I want to make that link as well. Okay, so then what's the story? So let me begin by telling you the story of what happened in India. I think many of you will know this, but for those of you who don't, you can be forgiven because it started on the 8th of November when the world was looking elsewhere. You know, it was looking at Washington and the election results and, uh, and so on, and you know, the rise to power of he who cannot be named and so on. And uh, so therefore, it didn't get much global coverage. But it was, I would argue, one of the most dramatic things to have happened anywhere in the developing world in the last decade, and certainly in India, in our post-independence history, it is one of the most dramatic things. Our Prime Minister went on television at 8 o'clock in the evening to announce that from midnight, uh, the notes, the currency notes that are worth 500 rupees and 1,000 rupees would be demonetized. That is no longer legal tender in a space of four hours. These notes, uh, he said, are high value notes. They're not really high value. 500 rupees is like the average of two days wages for unskilled daily labor. So it's not high value in that sense. But more to the point, these two notes together const constituted 86% of the value of currency in circulation. 86%, okay? Which is enormous, which is really the entire <laughs> uh, uh, and why is that important? Because India is a heavily cash-based economy. 95% of transactions are estimated to be in cash. 85% of the workers are in the informal sector, which runs entirely on cash. Half of the GDP comes from this informal sector, which is entirely cash-based. A lot of the formal sector's activities are cash-based, and so on. So you get the general idea. So this demonetizing of the notes was a very, very major move. And of course, he argued that this extreme and sudden step had to be taken uh, for many reasons, for corruption and, and you know, to counterfeiting, terrorism, all kinds of things. But it had to be secret. He couldn't have let anybody know, because then all these bad people would just go in there and change their money. And they wouldn't be caught out holding lots of money. That was the argument. Um, in fact, it turns out that this was, uh, it, we got continuously changing goalposts of this measure. It's now been more than 100 days uh, uh, since this measure was announced. And um, it turns out that the reasons that are advanced or the justifications that have been given have been continuously changing. So as I said, it began with anti-corruption. That you know, uh, there's this kind of confusion of currency with corruption that if you deal in currency, you are corrupt. So two basic confusions here. One is in terms of, if you like, black activities or you know, bad activities wrong, whether it is tax evading activities or straight criminal activities. So he was confusing the flows of these activities with the stocks of cash. So there was, a, if you like, a basic stock flow confusion in, in this argument. And the other was that even in terms of stocks, Nobody keeps the money in currency, right? They, they buy other things. They buy land, they buy real estate, they buy gold and jewelry, and most of all, they buy accounts in Swiss banks. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, base, you do other stuff with the money. In fact, all of the income tax rates in India since uh, the last decade have found less than 5% of the illegal assets or uh, uh, unjustified assets are held in the form of currency. So both of these were extremely, shall we say, problematic. And of course, it meant that the 95% of the currency that was being used for normal day-to-day -day transactions was not available anymore of these notes. OK, so the first was about corruption. The second was counterfeiting. That there's been, apparently, he said, although subsequently no evidence provided, we, are, we were post-truth well before the, it became a thing, OK? Uh, uh, Counterfeiting is, is increasing. It's all being done by our enemy across the border, Pakistan, and they are the ones funding terrorism. Now, in fact, a lot of, again, logical fallacies here. Terrorism is very cheap, especially in India. You can, I mean, the big, uh, the big bombing attacks in Mumbai in 26-11 uh, is what we call it. Uh, 
cost maybe a hundred thousand dollars. You know, it really doesn't cost very much to do terrorism, if you like. And in any case, counterfeiting, it's estimated there are about seven notes per million that are counterfeit, which is not a big deal. It's 0 0.00022%, you know, two percent of the amount. So not in that sense this huge problem. All right, counterfeiting. Of course, what do you do if you're worried about corruption and counterfeiting of high-value notes? You bring in a higher-value note. So <laughs> in having removed 500 and 1,000 rupee notes, they introduced a 2,000 rupee note. Because, <laughs> yeah. Um, which turned out to have no new security features so that, in fact, a good quality scan works. A good call, there have been lots of good quality scans that have been found all over the country, and now we even have the real genuine counterfeits as well <laughs> of 2,000 rupee notes. So, so that one didn't work too well. So then they said, okay, we're doing this because, you know, all this money will come into the banking system. So what happened? You had to take all, this, all your holdings of old notes and deposit them in the banks. And then, well, of course, you were allowed to exchange a small amount of it for new notes. 4,000 rupees only. The rest of it would be in your bank account. So what do you do if you need cash? Well, first of all, you have to have a bank account. I would remind you that 50% of the adult population does not have bank accounts. 80% of women do not have bank accounts. Okay, so, uh, okay, too bad. Uh, then you put the money in the bank account. Of course, you should then be able to withdraw money for your cash needs. Here's the thing, they had to keep it secret, so they didn't bother to tell the mints or the central bank or the people who actually would produce the new currency, as a result of which there wasn't enough new currency to go around. So we have had very, very stringent limits on withdrawal. So in fact, you were only allowed to withdraw 5,000 rupees a week or 15,000 rupees a week, etc. It's been extremely difficult. Even today, in most of rural India, there is this massive shortage of currency. They took out about 15.5 trillion. They have replaced just under 10 trillion in terms of value of notes. And most of that is in 2,000 rupee notes, which you can't use because you can't get change. I had a 2,000 rupee note in the early days. I had to go to three different seminars all over India. I, I came back with that 2,000 rupee note because nobody could give me change for it. You can, cannot actually use it. Okay, then they said, well, listen, because of all these bank deposits, first of all, we can track who hasn't been paying tax and grab them, and we can have more financial intermediation. These banks will then be going out there lending. When that didn't work, for reasons which I will come to, then they said, well, actually, what we really wanted to do was the cashless economy, because the cashless economy is the thing that is really modern and allows you to actually be you know, 21st century and prevent corruption of all kinds and so on and so forth. So I'll come back to the cash list thing because I think that one is actually quite significant. So what was the impact? Well, as I said, the remonetization was slow, was halting, was inadequate, and in fact, it's still not complete, okay? Only about two thirds of the money has been replaced. So there's been massive regulatory confusion. They kept changing the rules about withdrawals I won't give you details, but if you want to find out afterwards, some of them are really funny. Every single bit of the regulation that was announced on the 8th of November had to be changed the very next day because they had goofed. You see why we are so pre-Trump. We've done all of this before, okay? Um, the, the credibility of the Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of India, has taken a hit which it's unlikely that it will recover from in the immediate future. Now that's bad news. If your central bank takes a hit, and if your currency takes a hit, if people have been holding their cash holdings, which could be their savings, and in many cases for the poor, they are their savings, they are forced to give this into banks, and then they're not getting it back. There is a real problem. And when the rules about taking it, your, get, accessing your own money keep changing in all kinds of ridiculous ways, there has been a very, very significant impact in terms of the credibility of the bank. And these rules were particularly bad for those who were previously unbanked. The government m embarked on a big financial inclusion drive, and I want to come back to this one because financial inclusion is often seen as one of the best things about social protection and social policy. We'll come back to what financial inclusion does. We, what we've had in India is this extra, I, when we were talking about financialization this morning, I realized, what has really happened in India is the financialization of money, of currency. 
transactions have been financialized. Yeah, if this bends your mind, it should, because we will come to how it's done this. But basically, these new accounts that were opened, they were called Jandhan accounts, people's wealth accounts, and you could open them without all the, the heavy know your client stuff that most banks require. You just needed this universal um, identity card, another terrible uh, Orwellian thing that they have introduced, which is biometric, which requires your fingerprint and your iris and all of that, and you could open a bank account. But if you had a bank account like that, you could only put in 49,999 rupees. Couldn't put in more. Because clearly, only poor people would take these accounts. And if you're poor, you don't have money, right? That's the definition of poor. So how could you possibly, in your household, have 50,000 rupees? So you couldn't put in more than 50,000 rupees. And then, having put in all of that money, you could not take out more than 5,000 rupees a month. Because you're poor. I mean, clearly, if you're poor, you don't need money. <laughs> I have to tell you that the poverty line for a household comes to about 8,000 rupees a month. OK? So it was all right. So below the poverty line is what they were allowed to take out. The extraordinary thing, it's a tribute to, if you like, the Indian capacity for what we call jugar, ingenuity and flexibility and ability to adapt to all situations, is that all this money has been deposited. In other words, there were lots of loopholes in the system, and so they haven't told us exactly how much money has come back into the system, but the insiders tell us that more money has come back than was taken out. Okay, 15.5 trillion was taken out of circulation, and the estimate is that something like 16 trillion has come back in. Uh, how can that happen? Well, some of it is counterfeit, some of it is old notes that were lying around that had been, you know, expired, etc., etc. But so basically, it hasn't worked in terms of as they thought flushing out black money. It didn't work. Okay, but what did happen was a complete collapse in liquidity. It's very strange, you know, I'm not a big fan of ISLM framework, but uh, in the past, you know, uh, for the last few years in the developed capitalist world, we have been seeing the horizontal liquidity of money curve. Effectively, you know, negative interest rates, but in fact the real interest rates don't actually fall. And now we've seen the vertical curve, where bam, you basically just completely cut money supply. And what does that do? Well, we've seen now what it does. It causes economic activity to contract. We've had a massive contraction because people simply don't have money. And so there's been a decline in consumption, there's been a decline in employment, there's been a decline in the incomes of the self-employed, of migrants, you name it. There have been, uh, we don't have all the data yet, but all of the surveys and the immediate estimates tell us anything between 20 to 40 percent decline over the two months in terms of consumption squeezes, employment, output, activity, etc. In other words, fairly significant disaster. And peculiarly, you've had, talk about financial inclusion, you've had the re-emergence of traditional money lenders because the poor do not have access to actually cash, but it's a cash economy, you still need cash to survive. So you've had traditional money lending at very, very high interest rates, anywhere between 50 to 60 per month. We're talking about massive extraction from the poor. And of course, then there are medium-term macro effects as well. <coughs> the one I want to talk about a little bit more, 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah. OK, um, is in fact the cashless economy thing. Because I think that's important. And if you think that this is something crazy that can only happen in India, this part about the cashless, it might actually spread to all of you as well. So watch out a little bit. And it's very interesting. Globally, there's been this whole celebration of the cashless economy. We've had this book by Kenneth Rogoff, uh, I forget, the, the Something of Cash, what is it? The Crime of Cash, or you know, anyway, how terrible it is, basically. Uh, Stiglitz, of all people, has come out in favor of a cashless economy for different reasons completely. Paul Krugman has talked about the virtues of cashlessness and so on. Why? Well, Rogoff likes it because he thinks if you don't have, th that cash is the only thing that's preventing prolonged negative interest rates. And he thinks that's the only way to save capitalism now is to have prolonged negative interest rates. Now, we can have a discussion about that, but it's not going to save capitalism. Point. Okay. Stiglitz wants it because he thinks if you have only digital transactions and credit, you can actually auction bank credit to banks who will then be forced to lend it out because they will have paid for it already. 
weird, I think that's also pointless. You can basically just go for publicly directed banks allocating credit where you want it to be delivered and so on. But we then have an overwhelming demand for cashlessness in India, which is not entirely, shall we say, innocent, okay? <laughs> now, first also let's remember that there's no clear relationship between cash use and level of development. It's true, India is less developed and we have 95% cash transactions, but our cash to GDP ratio is only about 13%, okay? It is much lower than countries like Hong Kong, Japan. It is about the same as the Eurozone and Switzerland. Okay, a lot of other people you hold Swiss francs, but it's not that much higher than the United States. And the United States still has 60% of transactions in cash. So, in other words, there's no clear relationship between cash and development, okay? But the argument has been that cashlessness will, first of all, eliminate corruption because every single transaction will be recorded. It will enable more taxation and so on and so forth. It will actually prevent all the bad guys from either evading taxes or doing criminal activity. And of course, it will also allow real interest rates. But there's a thing in develop, uh, negative real interest rates. But in developing countries like India, it's really another very, very significant thing, which is that basically it means you are now charged for every transaction. The thing about money is that it's free. Currency money, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use the word money, whatever you want to, <laughs> cash transactions are free. I don't pay Andrew every time I buy him a coffee. In fact, I've never bought him a coffee, but if I did, <laughs> I could have paid for it without a cost to that transaction. Once you have, in fact, digitized transactions, somebody is paying for it, either the vendor or the purchaser. And in fact, most of these transactions, the cost actually declines with the increasing value of the transaction. So bank transfers in India, for example, you pay more for the low value transactions and less by, uh, in terms of ratio for the higher value transactions. What you are doing is forcing people to pay for the transactions. Now this, think of it, if you're forcing someone to pay, then somebody's making the money. So this is, if you like, the last great hinterland. Here's this huge economy where you're going to now force people to pay for every transaction. Somebody is going to be making the profits from it. Who will make the profits? Banks, fintech companies. The shares of the top three fintech companies exploded. They had front page, full page ad advertisements celebrating Mr. Modi because of you know, the sheer joy at this wonderful expansion. But what is quite interesting, and here this role of external donors that was talked about, people think it happens in tiny countries that are aid dependent. Well, there is a thing called Catalyst, which happens to be a joint venture between the USAID and the U Indian Ministry of Finance, which started about a year ago, but published a report in September about the significance of going digital. You explore a little bit about Catalyst, who's funding it, the Gates Foundation, Apple, Google, um, a bunch of fintech companies, a bunch of software development companies, and some banks. And they have been actively working with the Indian Ministry of Finance to promote digital transactions. Just to remind you a little bit about the reality of India, it's not just the lack of banking access, okay? As I said, 80% of women, half the adult population do not have bank accounts even today. Only 20% of bank accounts have debit cards. So a very small proportion has actually got debit cards. Most of our population is not functionally literate to be using computers and engaging in online transactions and so on and so forth. In any case, even if we could, we simply do not have the connectivity. We don't have the bandwidth. We have really low and poor connectivity. In my university, we have a market, right, with lots of shops and so on. There's one point of sale machine and it's always out of order. So we were, we were a cash economy. Everybody in my university in the heart of Delhi is, is a cash economy because you cannot actually ever get online to pay. We have um, 1,785 people per point of sale machine, okay, at the moment, compared to 60 in China and 25 in the US, just to give you an idea of the sheer physical difficulty of actually imposing cashlessness. And of course, then there are all these other issues of cybersecurity. We've already had a huge 
um, what is it called, a hack into the a credit and debit card system in October, uh, just the month before the demonetization was announced. And I was affected, it was many public sector banks, but one of my credit debit cards was affected, which basically meant it was frozen. Now, if that had been my only card, and if I didn't have cash, that would be it. I basically would not be able to transact. Uh, there are issues of privacy, the issues of surveillance, which are, I, I don't have to tell all of you, I mean, I think these are just issues that are talked about a lot in Europe and in the developed world, inadequately in India. We are the only country in the world where the acquisition of this data by a public entity, the Universal Identity, UID program, is actually sold to private companies. Not sold, sorry, it's given free. Shared with private companies. And the purpose of sharing is actually to enable these private companies to get very, very active in all of these financial transactions. To encourage fintech, to encourage digitization. This is, this is seen as a good thing. Just to remind you, the, the world trade in data last year was more than world trade in goods. Okay? Data is it. Data is the big thing now. Data is where profits are at. Data is the expanding market. <coughs> Large populations like India where it's relatively less data was up for grabs so far are the huge hinterland for these companies. And there's a massive potential for profit to be had over there. Okay, having said all that, then why on earth did it happen? <coughs> <laughs> this is, what were they thinking? Or rather, not they. What was he thinking? It's one man. Uh, really, it is really one man. Nobody knew. The finance minister didn't know. The central bank governor was told the day before, this is what you have to decide and tell us, advise us to do. So nobody else knew. There is, of course, this narrative of cleansing and modernizing the economy. And the remarkable thing is that despite the massive material damage, despite the direct hit on employment, livelihoods, on lives, at least 100 people have died because of inability to buy medicine, because of waiting in queues, because of, you know, all kinds of things. Despite all of that, there is still public support at some level. Not entirely, but there's this perception that, you know, he meant well. He's trying to attack corruption. Of course, control of the media helps. It's still very extensive. But there is this notion that, in fact, he wants to cleanse the economy and modernize it and, and cause, you know, you need to suffer. There are people who have lost jobs, who have lost livelihood, who say it's a sacrifice I'm making for the economy because we want the economy to be on a strong footing for our children. So that's something which has worked for a while. It's working less now because they also see that there are no rich people standing in the queues, right? There are no rich people suffering uh, at any level because of all this. But I would argue that the other reason is a slightly more complex reason, and it's very similar, as I said, we're, we're kind of pre-Trump in many ways. Um, disruption as a political economy strategy. You know, disruption, continuous disrupt, keep everybody on your toes. Uh, not necessarily in any way that they expect, and not necessarily in any way that will actually change the reality for them, but have a big shock, say that it is for your own best interests, and make everybody deal with the consequences, okay? So, again, at the moment, it seems to be working. But, and here I think, okay, if there's a saving grace, it's a very peculiar saving grace, but if there's a saving grace, it's this. All of these are, if you like, the classic elements of fascism, authoritarianism, you know, undesirable regimes, and so on. But successful fascist regimes have not been neoliberal, right? They generate employment. They, they, they involve lots of public spending in different ways, whether it's a military or what have you. This is still a neoliberal regime. So the strange thing that has happened is that despite all of this disruption, the response has remained a neoliberal one. Given that there's this massive increase in bank deposits, this was like a golden opportunity for the government to use this money, which effectively is free for it, to actually embark on a major public spending program, or even a large cash transfer program, or anything, but you know, something which would then make the people feel they took this money from the rich, now they're spending for us. They didn't do it. They just announced a budget, which is keeping to fiscal consolidation, not improving on public spending, not increasing social sector spending, 
not even doing any of those big bank cash transfers that were promised, okay? Um, however, the fact, or rather the broader point is that, in other words, the, the other social protection measures that did exist, whether you're talking about our pitiful attempt at pensions, I, I hesitate to even mention it, but we have a so-called universal pension for poor people, okay? That is to say, those who fall below the poverty line, and it is the enormous amount of 200 rupees per month, which is, what, three and a half euro per month, uh, has not been increased. Yeah, exactly, and it costs more for many poor people to actually go and collect this than, uh, it has not been increased. Even though the chief economic advisor is waxing eloquent about the basic income and how you know that's the way to go, etc., even this pitiful amount did not get increased. Other social protection measures have been actually completely undermined by this one move. So it's weird, but here is a policy, I won't call it monetary policy because it's not about the interest rate or anything, but it's a policy about money, if you like. Here is a policy about money which has completely undermined all of the existing social protection measures because they have been unable to cope with this tsunami of recession and economic <coughs> decline that was unleashed by this one act of demonetization. Okay, now, <laughs> therefore, what are the, finally the implications? The first implication, I think I just said it again, that policies, macroeconomic policies, about money particularly, can have huge implications for social policy, for social protection, for the extent of it, for the efficacy of it, for its ability to do anything at all, okay? Even when that policy, this particular one, demonetization, is not influenced by neoliberalism, and this one was not, okay? It, it's not a neoliberal policy, right? It's a crazy policy. It has no particular function. It, it's very strange in India to find economists across the ideological spectrum agreeing on anything. But for a change, to our surprise, we find everybody is in agreement that this was a really stupid and disastrous mistake. So it was not a neoliberal policy. But nonetheless, the ideological domination of neoliberalism is such that the fallout and the government's response to it have remained neoliberal. So in a sense, you are getting economically the worst of all worlds, politically perhaps not so much because at least it doesn't provide the political support for the more authoritarian kinds of tendencies. Okay, let me stop here and we can have discussion. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so yeah. um, the box is working again, so here, Ben, you to run to uh, Do we have, uh, Wait, the questions should I take a uh, first mm -hmm. round of questions? Yeah. questions? No, 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 no. Uh, Aisha and Katya. Jaita, thank you very much. I mean, this really is, is a spectacular thing which, uh, which we need to think about. But still, I, I'm unable to understand why he did that. I mean, is it complete craziness, or did he have a crazy advisor who advised him in this direction? Can you, can you be a little uh, more specific about that? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chajati. Impressive, absolutely impressive lecture about something we read in the news, but we didn't know a lot about all the consequences and how it happened. Uh, my question, you say it's not a particularly neoliberal instrument. However, when I compare it a little with, with uh, Lena's uh, presentation this morning about financialization and that, you know, kind of every move or instruments that, you know, deepens financialization, somehow we often relate it to neoliberalism. You know, if this really broadens markets and includes the entire population in the banking system and, you know, and in increases the profits. Isn't that part of a neoliberal agenda also? Yeah. 
Thanks, Jyoti. Well, I've lived through part of the demonetization, so I know how frustrating it was. But what amazed me, you know, in India, we're all ready to protest and uh, social movements and strikes take on for lots of reasons. But am I wrong in my feeling that there was relatively less, oh, greater acceptance in a way which is really, really weird in the case of India? I just would like you to, I mean, there were no really major fights or whatever about it. That amazed me, and I'd like you to comment on that. I, I, I think I know my uh, <laughs> football, or I, I did something different, but anyway. Um, uh, just a small question about, uh, you, I think uh, uh, this probably is totally crazy, uh, impulsive, uh, Trump-like, uh, but Modi uh, acted uh, whatever it was. But if you put it, you put it in the context of the cashless or cash-free or digital cash uh, society. That is something uh, about which people here in the Netherlands, some people here in the Netherlands are also very, very excited. Uh, I think you mentioned a couple of problems. Is it in the Indian case connected to the debate on, uh, what is it called, the, uh, the full, full reserve banking? And is it related to any sort of uh, monetary reform which can take different shapes, but which could also take more, li more neoliberal uh, shapes, perhaps? I mean, this is just like, is there a connection with that? Is there a debate? Please catch. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for your presentation. It's, it's very clear. Perhaps taking into account a recent commentary, uh, it's it is crucial the, the banking regulation, uh, regulation in terms that financial inclusion that do not include abuses in terms of costs, in terms of use of services, or uh, frauds, or uh, excessive cost uh, in, in, in the different products. But I don't know, perhaps that will be interesting and beyond. Also, uh, the, the, the activity of official banks in terms of of be perhaps a channel or how other alternative channels are to promote uh, good savings and, and credit about by uh, microfinance in terms of uh, have some financial uh, inclusion in a good manner for population and having any other gains for the economy in general. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for a very stimulating discussion. Uh, first a comment and then a question. Um, I thought it was very interesting that you do a comparison with uh, Switzerland, US, but also Japan uh, when making a point about there's nothing essentially or inherently superior about being cashless, right? Like Japan is a developed economy, but it still is a very cash-based economy. Uh, which got me thinking that ethos matter a lot in social policies as well. Like in India in general, and I would assume in Japan too, credit is not seen as something good, you know. Like we frown upon credit very much. So that was an interesting uh, point. Uh, my second question is more, um, I want to... I want to ask what, what does one really mean when uh, one says cashless? I mean, it, does it mean more credit-based economy or does it mean more debit-based economy? Because each of these things can have very different implications for the country. I mean, a credit-based economy could mean you could go down the U.S. path and, you know, the banks could be the modern-day versions of uh, serious money lenders. You're making money out of the misery of other people. Uh, and a debit-based economy could be slightly different. So the undesirability of it, the unfeasibility of it, it it's just interesting. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thanks very much for your presentation, and it's really nice to to have information from <laughs> India with first hand. And I find it so astonishing that when you are saying 95% uh, of the uh, tr transaction was in cash, so it means when they are doing a bit good bit business, they are carrying tracks of cash and <laughs> and I also wonder like how, how can they like finance a business like if they are, somebody wants to start a small business do they like borrow money from their family network or like, how do they finance in general and also I um, about the ca cashless economy um, f like a cashless economy has a huge development in China and nowadays people like doing shopping with their cell phones, not by cash or credit card even. And, and China have that development, right? Uh, because the banking system is really inefficient in China. So I would say if the, the banking or financing system in India is that poor, then there, there should be a, like opportunity for cashless uh, transactions. And that's really uh, actually like saving transactional costs. So uh, can you explain it more about that point? Thanks. Right. Th thank you very much. Um, Aisha, <laughs> why? Okay. There were many. Di there are many different explanations. We have very important assembly elections in five states, including the most populous state with 200 million, uh, 230 million people, happening right now. And there was a perception that, you know, he would do this big anti-corruption thing. And first of all, all his rival parties would be stuck with their cash holdings. And sec because, you know, his own party would get a legs up and they would actually, you know, know how to deal with it. And then people would say, oh, wow, he's so anti-corrupt and he's this knight in shining armor. So that was one of the things driving it. Uh, did he have any advisors? Well, as I said, most economists in India are agreed that this is stupid, okay? Mm -hmm. However, there's a bunch of crazy retired chartered accountants in a small town in Pune who actually um, had this idea. And then last year, they made a presentation to the prime minister, which was supposed to be 15 minutes, and it ended up being three hours. And they apparently have been in touch with him. <coughs> this little group of extremely right-wing Hindu chauvinist chartered accountants. We have all kinds of people. So anyway, they are the ones who actually drove this. He then got a couple of his trusted bureaucrats to be in this war room to design it, which explains why it's a complete mess. The rollout of it has been an unbelievable disaster uh, because you know nobody knew, and the mints were not ready, the central bank was not ready, nobody was ready in any way. So you know, um, but I think he genuinely, because he hadn't consulted anybody, he didn't anticipate the difficulties of remonetization, and he genuinely thought lots of the money would get extinguished, so-called, which would then become money that the RBI could declare you know, dividends, hand over to the central government as free money for it to spend. It didn't work, yeah? Because everybody managed to find devious ways of putting the money back into the system. So. But these are the arguments that are generally presented for why he did it. Rachel, why no protest? You know, this, of course, we've been all asking ourselves all the time. It's partly the rhetoric. You see, anti-corruption is such a powerful rhetoric. Everybody hates its corruption. Everybody's sick of it. Everybody's sick of rich people. Everybody, it's not just, you know, you're having to pay the, the local policeman, uh, you know, his weekly rate if you're a small shop owner and all that. It is this whole notion that there are all these fat cat people around you. And so many people who have been interviewed, who have suffered directly, say, yeah, we've suffered, but at least the rich are suffering, which they're not. But you know, the media has been pushing this thing that you know, some rich fellow has been caught with you know, so many trillion rupees and so on and so forth, which uh, they play it up and then they you know, just sort of forget about it. So there is a lot of that. And then, of course, protests were earlier seen that if you're protesting, that must mean that you have a lot of this black money. So people got nervous, it, which is why even the political parties were a little late to take it up. Nobody wanted to be seen as corrupt, you know? So I think all of those things played into it. Having said that, I think the tide is turning. They thought this would be useful, Aisha, in the elections. But in these UP elections, none of the ruling party people is daring to mention demonetization. <laughs> the note ban, you know, because 
people have cottoned on that actually, you know, it was a big waste and in fact it destroyed their livelihoods without doing anything. So I think the tide is turning on that. You know, this issue about, there are several questions about cashless, um, the kind, is it, does it matter whether it's credit or debit based? Uh, my friend from China <coughs> about, you know, that it can be more efficient if you don't have to carry large amounts of cash, sure. But you see, the number of transactions are very different from the volume of the transactions. Uh, so every time you buy, well in India people still buy lots of cigarette and beer or a cup of tea or whatever, all of these are cash, okay? A whole bunch of other transactions are cash because of the fact that most of this activity is informal. That's another claim made for this. It will force everything into the formal sector because you will have to record your, you know, you, you will have to do it through banks and so on and, and therefore, but that doesn't actually follow. Uh, the businesses, yes, they do carry large amounts of cash, but again, I come back to this point. You see, cash is still free. Cash provides you with a certain amount of freedom about, you don't, you don't have to wait for the connectivity. You don't have to wait for electricity supply, which I assure you is a big problem for, even for me. Huh? You don't have to, you're not dependent on something else for making this transaction. So yes, there's a convenience to cashless, but there's also a lot of inconvenience, particularly in terms of privacy, freedom, and the fact that you're not charged for every transaction which is a very big thing for people who are relatively poor, okay? Even in China, by the way, 60% of transactions are in cash. Not for your generation in the cities, but otherwise, in, in the aggregate. Okay, um, and this credit and debit based, in fact, you know, most of it is now mobile app based, or that's what they're trying to push, right? The Paytm, et cetera. The big thing that is being pushed is the e-wallet. You put in a certain amount of money and then you keep spending from it, which is a real pain in the neck because it's, you have to put in the initial cash and it's just basically allowing you to divide it up and you get charged for every transaction. You know, yeah. That's what they're pushing. They're now, they've created a public sector equivalent of this, the PMAP, which the Prime Minister is promoting big time, but the Prime Minister has also advertised for the private phone apps as well. Um, and there's a lot of crony capitalism in this, you know, Mr. Mukesh Ambani, our richest man, also one of the top 10 richest men, I think, is, uh, has just recently launched this uh, new telephone with a new mo an app that includes all these payment features and so on. Um, and these are almost all debit based. Why? Because most Indians are not credit worthy. There is a reason why. <laughs> It's not just that they don't have bank. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you can then, you know, invest it in. But the point is that it's all debit based. Also, not just because you can make, you know, money from it, but because most Indians are not credit worthy. They cannot access loans. They have to go to informal markets for loans. The banks are not going to give them the money, whether they are farmers or small producers or, you know, anything. So this whole idea that you can suddenly move everybody overnight into this cashless thing, it, it's not going to happen. Sarvas, yeah, this thing about is it related to full reserve banking? Not, the discussion in India is not about that, okay? The discussion in India is really about so-called cleanliness. You know, our prime minister is big on, in, on cleanliness. He launched a campaign, the Clean India Campaign, Swachh Bharat Mission, okay? And he claims this is a part of it. I'm gonna clean the dirt off the streets, I'm gonna clean the shit off the roads, everybody's gonna have their own toilet, and I'm gonna clean the economy of all this black money, yeah? Um, and in fact, uh, the, they, have, they seized on Kenneth Rogoff's book, because it, it said, I forget what it's called, the something of cash, but anyway, somehow it's bad. Okay? And they said, look, even this great American economist has said it's bad to have cash. And then Rogoff came to India and said, no, you shouldn't have done it so quickly, 20 years, you know. <laughs> you have to give people time to adjust, etc. So, you know, that, that didn't work so much. Yeah, I, Alejandro, you know, this is the other thing. This has been such a financially exclusionary move because they, for example, excluded cooperative banks and microfinance institutions. They were not allowed to even collect the old notes. And each cooperative bank, which you know, has anything from 100,000 to 300,000 <coughs> members, was treated as an individual. So I could withdraw 25,000 rupees a week, 
24,000, and so could the cooperative bank with 200,000 members withdraw 24,000 rupees a week. So basically, it forced people to abandon the cooperative banks and to abandon their self-help microfinance groups and move to commercial banks. So it was, in that sense, okay, neoliberal. So to get then to the question that Katya raised, yes, Katya, you're right. In one level, it was not neoliberal, but yes, in another level, it was neoliberal. And of course, it was neoliberal in the most profound sense, which is that it was the financialization of finance, if, it's such a, if you can imagine such a thing. Or if you like, it's the financialization of money. You are actually making the holding of cash, the transaction of cash, you are forcing a profit out of that. Okay, we, we, we were surprised when they started making money out of bottled water, but boy, were we innocent. Yeah? You, can, <laughs> you can make money out of everything now, it turns out. Even the making of money, you can make money out of. <laughs> which is really what this has done, in a sense. And you can understand, therefore, the significance of catalyst, uh, external influence, okay? Catalyst, as I said, this NGO set up by the Ministry of Finance and USAID, funded entirely by big American companies, fintech companies and banks and software companies. And they have expressed an extremely aggressive interest in pushing, if you like, yeah, pushing, forcing, coercing the Indian population into digital transactions. I don't think it will work, but what they're trying to do now is basically not remonetize enough. So they took out 15.5 trillion, they have put back only 10 trillion, and they've said we're not going to replace all the money, because people are going to go digital. So you're really forcing a recession and saying, well, if you don't want recession, you just go out there and pay digital, baby. Otherwise, live with your recession. It's an extraordinarily coercive move, which at the moment has still got some degree of popular legitimacy. Unbelievably, but at the moment. Okay, uh, ethos matters in, in policy making. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not that we frown on, no, it's not that we frown on credit because there's a huge amount of informal credit. You see, finally everybody, farmers, small, everybody needs credit. They cannot access the formal financial institutions, so they go to informal markets where the, the rates are incredibly high. So it's not, I would not say it's a social ethos that is driving the cash, it is simply the fact that we have not created genuine financial inclusion, and instead what we've done is actually, uh, how shall I put it? Instead what we've done is created this mirage of financial inclusion, which is actually deeply exclusionary in a peculiar kind of way. Okay, thank you. <laughs>